My name is Kunal. Hi, my name is Roshan. And welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, where we connect with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss some of the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. Today, we have Michael Katt joining us from Nebula Ventures. Michael, thank you for jo- Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Thank you for having me. Glad, glad to be here. Excellent, excellent. And and Michael, so so we hear you, you're you're somewhat of a of a blockchain pro, right? So so how did how did it all start for you? Uh, uh, when it when it came to this, you know, you know, it's funny you said the word pro because you know. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's all relative, I guess, you know, to somebody on the street, you could be called a pro, but then when you start meeting with industry experts, you know, I guess like the people in their fields that have been here for like, you know, since 2010, you feel like you're an amateur still. Right. Mm-hmm. But, uh, how did it all begin with me? Um, so roughly, uh, I think it was three, about two and a half years ago. Um, I was returning home from spring break and I studied like all the, the week before I was studying for this, you know, thermodynamics, uh, systems test. And, uh, that's like all I was studying for. And it went awful. And I realized I had zero passion for mechanical engineering, but I'd always had an interest in finance and, you know, finance and, you know, financial market infra- infrastructure. So I decided to pivot, dropped the majority of my classes and decided to pivot to, you know, what is high frequency high trading, mm-hmm. algorithmic trading and the like. And I wanted to put my own skin in the game, you know, have some money of my own to put, put you know, to make money off of. But uh, then I started looking at exchange rates uh, for stock exchanges and I was like, well, this is impossible. And I was really fortunate that fortunate enough to have a friend that you know sh- sh- pulled up the Coinbase app, where you could, it was a, you know where you could buy and sell you know cryptocurrency, and my mind was blown just by one the volatility of the market, and you know the appreciation that was beginning with you know Ethereum rising from eight dollars to three hundred and fifty, you know all of a sudden there's like you know multi billion dollar market caps out here, and I didn't know this stuff existed, so from there I decided to you know start my own little my own miniature fund. Um, it was really small at the time, and this is back when the crypto market was roughly. $65 billion. Right. Mm-hmm. And from there, it, it, in, in that time period, you know, in 2017, in, a pre, in, in about a mm-hmm. six-month period, the cryptocurrency market appreciated from $65 billion to $800 billion, you know, a lot of outrageous growth, mm-hmm. um, also caused, but mostly caused by the ICO hype, you know, initial coin offerings. And so from there, I decided, you know, a lot of people jumped into cryptocurrency just because they wanted to make a quick buck. But, you know, if this technology really is going to revolutionize the world, which I believe it will, um, it's going to be the way you're going to really, you know, reap value from it is if you dive into the weeds and, you know, actually figure out how it's wor- how it works and how it can bring economic right. utility um, to society. And so from there, I, um, I decided to, you know, one of the things that you, know, you realize with this technology is that there's a giant knowledge gap between one uh, university students and what they're studying. Um, the inter- industry as a whole, you know, you have like p- people, people like in the cryptocurrency industry, they basically are speaking. Uh, they're all very intelligent individuals, but, you know, if you can't have a fifth grader understand what you're talking about, you're going to have a hard time uh, c- convincing a, you know, 60-year-old CEO at a bank that, you know, what you're doing is smart as well. you gotta, you got to, you know, simplify the matters and educate people. And so at the same time, I know I was at the University of Kansas um, in the business school now um, studying business analytics, and I realized that there's a great a giant opportunity for um, to launch a research center uh, surrounding cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Um, and so from there, I... Um, I started you know, recruiting some guys in both the university, uh, both the computer science department and, you know, the business school. And we decided to find, uh, found the uh, University of Kansas Blockchain Institute, uh, basically a fintech, fintech center uh, focused around blockchain and, and its use cases. Um, you know, mostly, you know, this is now it's, you know, really, it's really grown into mm-hmm. a great thing um, where we're doing a lot of research with, you know, a lot of postgraduates and, uh, you know, computer science uh, researchers. Um, and we've done, also, we're really fortunate enough to, you know, by chance, the uh, CEO of Ripple Labs was also a Jayhawk uh, alumni. We are, are um, a KU, our mascot's the Jayhawk. Um, and so he's also from the town right next door to me. And so his name is Brad Garlinghouse, and we were really fortunate enough to get in touch with him. And Ripple Labs has a 50, had a $50 million um, uh, university research, research grant program. And we were able to land, we were able to land $2 million wow. of that. Wow, wow, congrats. And it's really, you know, helped us. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, man. So that the money hit in like April, uh, in Jan- January of this past year. And it's really, you know, I guess it's really accelerated the program and let, it, let us do a lot of cool things. Um, we put on a digital finance conference with a lot of great startups and the industry leaders um, this past April. 
And then we have a cybersecurity um, conference surrounding blockchain and how it applies to um, how, it's, how we can secure um, supply chain um, networks. Uh, and, you know, I think it's scheduled for October 18th of this year. So, you know, things are coming around pretty well on that. In that no, regard. I bet. And, and are you planning on, you know, being, being one of the founders of this fantastic uh, blockchain institute at University of Kansas? Um, are you planning on going back? Uh, to attend these conferences or meetings as an alum what's what's your plan for down the line oh yeah absolutely i mean one is just to go back and see your Mm -hmm. old teammates um you know catch up with your you know the old faculty that you know a lot of the faculty were like pinnacle to basically accelerating a program and you know it's 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 tough to navigate you know a university without the support of the faculty that's one thing for sure so i mean really happy you know two guys that really were you know fundamental fundamentally fundamentally helpful with us were um perry alexander he runs the uh ITTC, mm-hmm. which is the research center at AU, and then uh, Dieter Schrader as well. Um, and also, also Felix Mesty. I got to give these guys the credit because they've been really helpful to the organization, and I'm happy to come back and see them. I, I bet. And I, I think before we, we uh, you know, Roshan takes the call and pivots into, uh, you know, talking about blockchain, the one thing I wanted to, that I found very interesting about your profile, and I think for listeners out there, is how your background in college changed many times. Do you kind of want to discuss that when you were thinking and going through uh, what you wanted to do in your degree? Right, man. So I guess, you know, my background and how I, you know, my college experience was uh, the education uh, portion of it was really, uh, it was hectic to say the least. I made a lot of pivots. So, I mean, at a young age, when I was in fourth grade, I, started you know we were playing the stock market game and i we my all my friends were getting apple ipods or getting apple ipods and um the ipod video just come out or like you could watch videos on your ipod and i was like this is all anybody's ever talking about and so i was like hmm, i bet apple would be a good stock to you know you know put my money on you know or to you know to follow mm-hmm. and then i won the stock market game that year and then the same kind of thing happened in 2013 with tesla you know i was really interested in that company and then their stocks really took off so i was always really interested in how you could invest in technology and its impact that it would have on the world of finance or like in in investments. Um, But from that regard, so I went went in as a finance student um, at the University of Kansas. And then I realized like, you know, my brother was a civil engineer now. He just graduated and I was like, you know, engineers, you know, the smartest people in the room are always gonna be the engineers um, usually. So I was like, I'll pivot to, you know, I was also really interested in space naturally um, from, you know, SpaceX and Elon Musk. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna go be an aerospace engineer, which keep in mind aerospace engineers, uh, the, 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 the academic portion, uh, it's about 20% retention rate. So only one in five people who start as an aerospace engineer finish. Um, and it's funny how that turns out because a year later I was, now I was a mechanical engineering <laughs> major and, um, pivoting for more, you know, wider array of classes, essentially, you know, more industries to go into. And then, um, but really I just, you know, you start studying power plant design and, you know, all of a sudden your equations are taking up, you know, two to whole pages and you're having panic attacks. Like, am I going to finish this test? Right, time? right. And then you realize, I just don't like this. You know, it's like you, you do what you yeah, like, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's comes, you know, mm-hmm. students, I think it's important for students, you know, really like, if you don't like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of portions of school aren't fun, you know, classes stink, but think, find something you're really interested in, you know, just really don't be afraid to go say like, oh, wow, I think that's really cool. Because if you like what you're doing, it's not going to feel like work. And when it doesn't feel like work, then that's where you can really excel. Like people do what they're good at. You know, people, like basketball players don't practice every single day because like what they do because they want to be great. But I mean, if you make threes, if you every single shot you make goes in when you're practicing, it feels a lot better than, you know, throwing a football into the like, you know, you know, or like, you know, playing golf and, you know, hitting a shank every right. time. Right. Um, so that's kind of how my pivot started. And at the same time, uh, when I was you know launching the organization at KU, um, I decided to also get really interested in venture capital. Um, you know, because I figured a lot of the light, a lot of the things I was interested in were also starting to take off in the venture capital world. Um, so I actually um, I guess this is where. Uh, I kind of like I saw transition and talk about um, the hack fund. Um, I was at Ber- uh, Berkeley was putting on this uh, crypto economics conference okay. in okay. downtown mm-hmm. San Francisco at, at the Hilton, at the Hilton. And um, I like met these guys at the hack fund there. Um, the hack fund was, uh, is it, you know, VC based in uh, San Jose. And what they were doing was they were, they were providing a security token offering or essentially what they were doing was they were taking digital, uh, they're taking stock certificates and they're issuing them, issuing them on Ethereum. And what that means is that they were basically um, making blockchain uh, compatible um, stocks, stock certificates. Um, and they're trying to raise money that way. And right, they're having this issue, right, um, when, when it comes to raising money because ICOs or initial coin offerings were starting to plummet. Nobody was throwing money into them mm-hmm. anymore. 
And so they had this issue where like, all right, well, we're trying to raise money for legit operations. Like, you know, a lot of ICOs are um, essentially they're vaporware. You know, they're honestly scams. 98% of ICOs are scams. Um, but what we're, what we're doing, we want to invest in startups. We want to basically remove the barrier. The issue that we, we, in venture capital, the reason nobody can jump in is that one, um, in America, there's a lot of laws. Um, you have to have a little, quite a bit of money if you're an accredited investor. So that's one reason why it's tough to invest in venture right, capital. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and two is that it's all based on a, it's all based on networks. Mm-hmm. So how do we um, how do you democratize this experience and how do people get exposure to startups in Silicon Valley and globally in general? Mm-hmm. And so what they're like, well, shit. I mean, uh, we'll just uh, pardon my language. We'll just uh, we'll invest the money. It's a closed in fund, mm-hmm. meaning so like all the money that is invested, we invest in these startups, and the fund grows through exits. So when you sell, when a startup gets bought out by Facebook, um, you know that money, the the profits are then reinvested back in the fund, and that's how it grows. Um, so the problem they're having is that they have this great idea, but the way they're raising money is not working. Um, and so what are they gonna? What, how are they gonna do this? Um, well, it turns out uh, at the hack fund they found out that they're offering. They had some. There's a buddy from JP mm-hmm. Morgan that stopped by, and he was like, "Hey, your offering is very similar to a closed end IPO." And so Draper Esprit, um, uh, Draper uh, is, is another similar fund. They're based in the UK, and um, so they And then this is why they kind of opened up the door. And I was like, at the same time, they didn't want to like you know abandon in the blockchains and stock certificates. And I was like, all right, guys. Well, maybe we should think back to how we're going to market these to because we were first marketing the problem that the hack fund had was they were marketing to um basically very risky uh investor types people are looking for a quick return on their buck they want to buy a token and they want to sell it on the exchange right when it right when it it is listed um but instead they should be targeting institutions Mm -hmm. um family private family offices you know basically high net worth individuals so i was like the problem with these groups is that one they're traditionally much older they're you know much more uh they're much used to like traditional finance methods. So I was like, well, we're gonna have to pivot how we talk about security tokens or digi- these, these digital stock, stock certificates. Um, and let's be too quick about it. So I mean, let's be cute about it. So uh, let's look back at what actually a security token is. It merely is just a um, Ethereum token that is, uh, it's called a smart contract. So we have these Ethereum tokens called smart contracts and the simplest uh, contract in finance is a stock and as a stock certificate. And that basically says, hey, you are legally entitled to this portion, this much of a company, right? So I was like, let's take uh, that idea and let's mer- merge the two together. So why not we just call them smart, uh, smart stocks or um, smart shares? Mm-hmm. And so that, that I was like, I was when I was sitting in the office for the first time there and I was sitting across from Jonathan Nelson, the uh, fund manager at Hack. And he's like, damn, that's a good idea. And now I, when I go out, Jonathan's always going invited to like, van, you know. You he's talked to your events. Speaking right, yeah. events are... Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got a nice top tier events and he starts saying the word smart stock and smart share and it brings a smile to my face because that's like, you know, where the idea, you know, really was birthed. Um, so I was I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm on a tangent yeah. right now, but I guess I, you know, um, but yeah, I guess, you know, how that transition to in. So I did, I worked at the hack for about six months at hack for about six months and it was a great time. You know, I still talk to them a lot. Um, they're having a lot of success. Um, they ended up transitioning in that to what, an IPO initial public mm-hmm. offering um, on the London Stock Exchange for Q1 of next year. So that's, that's really exciting awesome. to hear. Okay. And, uh, you know, while I was doing all this, that was like through like the fall and spring. And then in the, in the summer, I met a guy named James Cusinas, a really nice Australian who had just moved to America, an entrepreneur uh, launching a new fund called Nebula Ventures. Mm-hmm. Um, and they invest in seed stage to uh, like seri- uh, Series D um, in fintech and prop- property technologies. Um, and they're based out of Sydney and New York. And so what I've been doing for them right now is I'm, you know, sourcing, uh, find, you know, investment opportunities, mostly in FinTech, um, though we do get some property tech coming through as well. Um, James has been a great mentor and, uh, you know, I've learned a lot about um, basically, you know, it's really opened a lot of doors, you know, from navigating hedge funds, mm-hmm. um, you know, meeting a lot of cool people, um, a lot of hedge funds in the, you know, the cryptocurrency space, so the, D, you know, DeFi space, decentralized finance for people that don't know. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, even some crazy, some, even some crazy stories with some guys coming to you saying, you know, we got a hundred thousand, we have, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin for sale, help us sell it. You know, some crazy stories like that. You know, it's, OTC it, trades, right? Nothing actually came up it, but it's OTC right, right. trades. Yes. Very, uh, when you're trying to sell, right. When you're trying to sell, you know, $500 million worth of that, Bitcoin, that's, you uh, can't do it on the exchange, right? Either, that's, a, that's a whole different ball game, right? Uh, when dealing with those whole, things. Whole different, whole crazy, crazy exactly, ball game. Exactly. Right? Whole different ball game. Um, I wanted to I wanted to ask when it came to you're currently with Nebula and before you were with Hack Fund, 
what was the difference in the deal size and the investment size that you guys would make in pre-seed seed Series A startups? 